Uh, colleagues, uh, good afternoon. I am uh, honored and humbled uh, to be in this very special place, surrounded by people who have had many a lifelong interest in the Russian Revolution, in the subject uh, we commemorate, in the event that we commemorate uh, this week and next week, this year. In my remarks, I want to revisit the main conclusions uh, of my writings on 1917, especially as they relate to the key, still highly controversial and politicized question of how the Bolsheviks won out in the struggle for power uh, in 1917 Petrograd. But let me start with just a very few words about the views of other earlier historians, other historians on this issue. I suspect uh, it's not necessary for most of the audience. Uh, to Soviet historians, of course, the October Revolution was the legitimate expression of the will of the revolutionary Petrograd masses in support of Bolshevik power led by a highly disciplined vanguard party, brilliantly led by Lenin. An elaborate, precisely orchestrated myth was constructed around this interpretation to which Soviet historians were obliged to adhere. Parenthet parenthetically, I should say that uh, during the last several months, I have spent a good deal of time in Russia, a good deal of time among Russian historians. I have participated in 1917 conferences, uh, two or three in Moscow and uh, one in uh, Petersburg. And I'm pleased to be able to say that finally, finally at long last, uh, young Russian historians are starting to do serious, uh, important, illuminating new work on the revolution. Uh, this was a revelation for me. I've been going to Russia for uh, almost every year since the 1960s uh, to do my research. Um, but this year, for the first time, I, I saw this uh, new uh, kind of interest um, uh, at, at the level of scholarship, at a popular level, uh, new myths, myths are being built. Western historians, on the other hand, have tended to view the Bolshevik success as the consequence of uh, the provisional uh, government's uh, weakness, softness towards the radical left, a historical accident, or most frequently, the result of a well-executed military coup lacking significant popular support. This coup, this coup, many assert, was carried out by a small, united, highly authoritarian and conspiratorial organization controlled by Lenin and subsidized by Germany, successful because of German money. To Western, uh, historians holding this view, the structure and practice of the Bolshevik party in 1917 uh, were the inevitable progenitor of Soviet totalitarianism. And this view, as you know, remains quite common in the West today. The conclusions of my research uh, depart on 1917 departed in significant ways from these common Soviet and Western interpretations. By way of illustration, let me point to a few important, still frequently overlooked moments during the crucial summer and fall of 1917 that seem to me of special importance in understanding the character and course of the October Revolution in Petrograd. 
I will then summarize how Red October looks to me today. The first of the moments uh, which I want uh, to turn, to which I want to turn, is the failed July uprising, which appeared to many at the time and most Western historians since as an unsuccessful attempt by Lenin to seize power as a kind of dress rehearsal for Red October. In my first book, Prelude to Revolution, which came out many, many years ago, 1969, I concluded that the chaotic, bloody, ultimately unsuccessful July uprising was an accurate reflection of unwillingness on the part of soldiers in the war-inflated Petrograd garrison to accept transfer to the front in support of the July 1917 Russian offensive. It also reflected genuine, widespread, spiraling impatience and dissatisfaction on the part of the la large mass of Petrograd factory workers, soldiers, and Baltic Fleet sailors with the continued maintenance of the war effort and the meager social and economic uh, benefits of the February 1917 revolution. With regard to the Bolshevik role in the preparation and organization of the July uprising, I concluded uh, uh, th that the eruption was partly the outgrowth of four months of steady uh, Bolshevik agitation and propaganda. That factory and unit level, uh, unit, uh, level uh, Bolsheviks played leading roles in starting the event and that extremist leaders of two major auxiliary arms of the party, the Bolshevik Military Organization and the Bolshevik Petersburg Committee, committee responsive to their uh, new impatient followers, encouraged it against the wishes of Lenin and a majority of the Central Committee. From my study of the July uprising, I also ventured several broader generalizations with important implications for later events. One set of generalizations concerned mass attitudes in Petrograd toward the provisional government, Soviets, and the Bolsheviks at that time. Studying the evolution of popular opinion between February and July, I concluded that among Petrograd workers, soldiers, and sailors who acted politically in any way, the provisional government was already then, that is by the middle of the summer of 1917, widely perceived as an organ of the property classes opposed to fundamental political and social change and uh, uh, cold uh, to popular uh, needs and aspirations. On the other hand, although the lower classes of the Petrograd population were increasingly critical of the moderate socialists for their support of the provisional government and the war effort, they nonetheless viewed Soviets at all levels as genuinely democratic institutions of popular self-rule. Hence, the important and growing popular attraction of two main uh, Bolshevik uh, slogans. All power to the Soviets, vsya vlas sovietam, uh, pending uh, the convocation of a constituent assembly, it was always added, and immediate peace. Uh, as to the Bolsheviks, the abortive July uh, uprising ended in a painful, seemingly decisive defeat for them. Nonetheless, uh, what appeared most significant to me as I finished that book was the great popularity of the radical Bolshevik program demonstrated uh, before and during the July uprising. At a time when popular expectations for meaningful change were sky high, and when most all other major political groups were demanding patience and sacrifice in the interests of the war effort, the radical Bolshevik political program, and the party's apparent responsiveness uh, to the aspirations of ordinary citizens contributed significantly to the very considerable influence and strength it managed to acquire 
in just a few months uh, since February. And this led me to a second set of generalizations reflected in the July experience. These gener uh, generalizations related to the traditional image of the Bolshevik party in 1917 as an essentially united authoritarian conspiratorial organization tightly controlled by Lenin. Based on exhaustive empirical research, many years of it, I concluded that this image bore precious little uh, uh, relation to reality. It was not simply that from top to bottom, from March 1917 on, the Bolshevik organization included right, left, and centrist uh, factions, each of which helped shape the party's policies. No less important, it seems to me, was the fact that amid the unstable, locally varying, constantly changing conditions prevailing in revolutionary Petrograd in 1917, not to speak of the whole country, uh, the Bolshevik Central Committee was simply unable and, uh, to control nominally subordinate uh, agencies. Lower level party organizations were relatively free to tailor their appeals and tactics uh, to their interpretation of the developing situation on the ground. The importance of this factor in interpreting the Bolshevik party's behavior during the 1917 revolution was, I concluded, difficult to overestimate. Further, I found that Lenin's pre-revolutionary conception of a small professional conspiratorial revolutionary vanguard had become obsolete after the February Revolution. And indeed, the party's doors were immediately open wide to tens of thousands of new members who also helped shape policy. Consequently, to a significant degree, the Bolshevik organization in Petrograd was, was, was both open to and responsive to the needs of the popular masses. No doubt, this caused great difficulty in July. However, I concluded that in the longer run, the Bolsheviks' extensive, carefully cultivated connections in plants and factories, in a myriad of local worker organizations, in Soviets, in factory shop committees, in trade unions and the like, um, and of course in military units, uh, that, that all these, these contacts were an important source of the party's strength and ultimately its ability to take power. The second revealing moment in 1917 that I want to touch on is the brief period of reaction in Petrograd that followed the collapse of the July uprising. This was the time, uh, uh, I will remind you, when the initially successful Russian offensive on the Eastern Front was turned into a most terrible rout of the Russian army, and when Alexander Kerensky first became prime minister. Kerensky headed a liberal, moderate, socialist coalition government overwhelmingly concerned with suppressing the Bolsheviks, re restoring political authority and order domestically, if necessary, by force. Often Kerensky tried to sound like Bismarck. And somehow shoring up the collapsing front. Momentarily, it appeared that a lull had been reached in the revolutionary uh, workers' movement. Public opinion in Petrograd seemed to have swung decisively rightward. Yet despite a constant barrage of flamboyant, uh, flamboyant hardline rhetoric by Kerensky, incess incessantly echoed by temporarily uh, resurgent conservative uh, civil and military groups, it was clear that none of the repressive measures loudly proclaimed by Kerensky were either fully implemented or achieved their objectives, which is not to say that they could have achieved, that they were capable of achieving their uh, objectives. Um, more than this, the apparent increasing danger of counter-revolution 
reflected in such events as the Moscow State Conference, which was a huge conference at the Bolshoi Theater uh, in Moscow of right-wing groups. Uh, heightened popular suspicion of the provisional government and stimulated the desire to let bygones be bygone, bygones and unite more closely in defense of the revolution. This mass response to what were popularly perceived as dangerous threats to the revolution were reflected in numerous mutually reinforcing documents of the time. If hostility towards the Bolsheviks on the part of ordinary citizens dissipated in the face of the apparent threat of counter-revolution within a few weeks after the July uprising, then already by the second half of August, that is before the attempt at Kornilov, uh, General Kornilov's uh, failed rightist putsch, uh, there were increasing signs that the party with the apparatus, with this apparatus uh, intact, had embarked on a new, I think this is my phone, could you turn it off? <laughs> For, sorry, I thought I turned it off. Um, I, I found that before, um, well before the, the failed rightist putsch of General Kornilov, um, the pendulum had swung backwards uh, towards uh, and in favor of the Bolsheviks. And this was reflected clearly in the results of mid-August elections to the Petrograd City Duma, which the Bolsheviks uh, won. They won a resounding victory uh, in those local elections. Inevitably, perhaps, with the very existence of the Russian state immediately threatened by military forces from outside and by political, social, and economic disintegration within. And with the Kerensky government so obviously unable to stem uh, still increasing instability, liberal and conservative groups would look to the high command of the army uh, for salvation. The efforts of some of these element, elements culminated in the so-called Kornilov affair of late August. As I think with you today about the uh, uh, Kornilov's failed writer's putsch, my primary concern is not with still debated among historians uh, questions of Kornilov's objectives um, and personal ambitions or Kerensky's uh, possible involvement uh, with uh, Kornilov uh, uh, in trying to squash the Soviets. The aspect of this revealing historical interest, uh, moment that interests me most right now is what the struggle against Kornilov in Petrograd revealed about the attitudes and power of ordinary citizens then and about the impact of the Kornilov experience on the stature of the Bolsheviks. With this in mind, I will recall briefly what occurred in Petrograd following Kerensky's announcement on August 27th that General Kornilov had refused to recognize his authority and indeed that troops loyal to him were already on trains and nearing the capital. The cadet party, the constitutional Democrat, the main, the main Russian liberal party, uh, sympathetic to Kornilov's objectives and distrustful and scornful of Kerensky, refused to support him. For the briefest time, it appeared that Kornilov could not be stopped from taking the capital and that the provisional government and the revolution would surely fail. But all political groups to the left of the cadets, Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, SRs, anarchists, literally every labor organization of any importance and soldier and sailor committees at all levels immediately band together in defense of the revolution. This was before the internet, uh, before you could uh, uh, sound the alarm and you could get a whole city up, um, but it, 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 it came as close as was possible at that time. 
under the, under the direction of the Rail Workers Union. Communications between Kornilov in southern Russia and his forces advancing on Petrograd were cut, and trains uh, carrying insurgent troops were derailed. Wherever Kornilov's uh, forces were stranded, officers were forced to stand by helplessly as crowds of delegates from mass organizations, some of them coming from Petrograd, but some from local villages and towns, uh, uh, quickly persuaded Kornilov's troops that were special forces that were picked because of their uh, loyalty to Kornilov uh, not to move further and to pledge to support the revolution. The entire episode was over in a few days without a shot being fired. In the first flush of this triumph over the counter-revolution, most organizations in Petrograd that had taken part in the anti kornilov uh, movement expressed their views about the nature, makeup, and program of a future government in a torrent of political res re uh, resolutions. Now, these resolutions, um, were clearly uh, not authored uh, from one place. They differed very significantly uh, in content. Uh, yet common to most of them was aversion to any kind of further political collaboration with the property classes and attraction for the immediate creation of some sort of exclusively socialist, multi-coalition, multi-party coalition government that would end the terrible war. It was apparent that to many, including even Lenin, uh, to many Bolsheviks, including Lenin, the, the swift defeat of Kornilov uh, confirmed the immense political pot potential of all uh, revolutionary groups, all socialists working together. It seemed uh, to me that there were other noteworthy ramifications of the Kornilov experience. For the time being, the rightist movement was shattered. That was clear. It didn't rise its head again until the Civil War. And because of their behavior, both before and after the crisis, the liberal, the cadet party, uh, was widely uh, suspected of having been in league with Kornilov. The cadets were now weakened and deeply demoralized. Moreover, because of intense disputes over the character and composition of a future government, the Mensheviks and the SRs were scarcely in better shape. Each included rapidly uh, growing left uh, factions uh, whose immediate goals were closely aligned with those of moderate Bolsheviks. And meanwhile, the Russian economy continued to disintegrate. In Petrograd, food and fuel shortages became much more acute. The Kornilov affair also did enormous harm to Kerensky's reputation. Among the competitors for power in 1917, uh, Petrograd, the Bolsheviks were clearly the big winners in this failed rightist mood. Yet, I disagree with historians that suggest that uh, Kornilov's defeat made the victory of the Bolsheviks inevitable um, and also a bloody civil war inevitable. Uh, of course, Kornilov's failure testified to the great potential power of the left and demonstrated once again the enormous popular attraction of the Bolsheviks program of radical change. However, the mass mood was not specifically Bolsheviks, Bolshevik in the sense of reflecting a desire for a Bolshevik government. That, it seems to me, is a terribly crucial point. For the fact is that the idea of a Bolshevik government had never been raised before. In the eyes of Petrograd workers, soldiers, and sailors, the Bolsheviks stood for democratic Soviet power, for multi-party Soviet popular democracy. This was now an impediment to their unilateral seizure of power. For as the flood of post-Kornilov resolution showed, the city's lower classes 
were attracted more than ever by the possibility uh, of creating a Soviet government uniting all democratic socialist elements. This then was my reading of a few significant, often overlooked historical moments during the summer of 1917 that seemed to me, when I wrote my book in mid-1960s, before many of you were born, uh, 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 these moments uh, seem to me of uh, particular importance in understanding Red October. Framed against this background, let me suggest how the Bolsheviks in, uh, Bolshevik success in October 1917 played out. In mid-September, Lenin, then still hiding out in Finland, sent two historically momentous letters to the party leadership in Petrograd. In these letters, which came as a bolt out of the blue, Lenin demanded that the Bolsheviks in Petrograd organize an armed uprising without losing an instant. However, Lenin's directive contained in these two letters were quickly, immediately rejected by unanimous vote of the Central Committee. There were several reasons for this wholly negative horrified response. For one thing, the receipt of Lenin's uh, directive coincided with the start of the Democratic State Conference. This was a time when party leaders in the capital, under the impression that they had Lenin's blessing, were uh, oriented toward trying to get a majority of the Democratic State Conference to transfer power uh, to the Soviets. This effort failed. The fact that the Bolshevik leadership ignored Lenin's orders even after it became clear that the Democratic State Conference would not abandon coalition politics was partly due to the influence of moderate Bolsheviks such as uh, Lev Kamenev. However, most significant, it seemed to me, is that even Bolshevik leaders like Trotsky, leaders who in principle shared Lenin's fundamental theoretical assumptions regarding the necessity and feasibility of an early socialist revolution in Russia, were skeptical of mobilizing workers, soldiers, and sailors behind the immediate bayonet charge, this was a phrase that was used at the time, that Lenin was demanding. The situation was similar uh, to that during the heyday of the reaction in the immediate aftermath of the July uprising. At that time, most party leaders on the spot in Petrograd uh, ignored, Lenin was then in hiding, ignored Lenin's demand that they abandon Soviets as revolutionary organs. Now, towards the end of September, once again, these Bolsheviks seem to have a more realistic appreciation than Lenin of the limits of the party's influence and authority among ordinary citizens and of the continuing popular attachment to Soviets as legitimate democratic organs in which all genuinely revolutionary groups would collaborate to fulfill the revolution. Consequently, together with the left SRs, and I wish I had more time to talk about them, they're, uh, they're a much more important group than commonly assumed. Together with the left SRs, the left socialist revolutionaries, the left wing of the SR party, they began to associate the seizure of power and the creation of an also socialist coalition government publicly with the early convocation of another National Congress of Soviets. This in order to take advantage of the legitimacy of Soviets at a popular level. The impact of the outlook of workers, soldiers, and sailors on Bolshevik tactics was most pronounced during, two weeks, during the two weeks preceding the overthrow of the provisional government. Yes, 
at a historic session of the Central Committee on October 10th, in which Lenin participated at his first meeting since going into hiding, it was resolved to make an ins insurrection the order of the day, put on the agenda, the immediate agenda. Yet despite this green light for organization of an armed uprising, the Petrograd masses were not called to arms. Once again, this was partly due to the frantic efforts of uh, Kamenev and uh, uh, Grigory uh, Zinoviev uh, to head off violence against the government. However, in the wake of the Central Committee's historic decision of October 10th, militantly inclined party leaders in closest touch with workers and lower ranking military uh, personnel. In other words, Bolsheviks who sided with Lenin in principle earnestly explored the possibility of organizing an armed uprising. And after several days of circulating in the districts, in, in plants, in factories, in military ba the barracks, significant numbers of them were forced to conclude that the party was technically, technically unprepared to uh, initiate a men, uh, immediate military action against the government. They also concluded that most ordinary citizens would not be responsive to a call by the party to rise before the fast approaching Congress of Soviet was scheduled for October 20, which, bear in mind, the Bolsheviks themselves had been touting over and over and over uh, was revolutionary Russia's highest political authority pending convocation of a constituent assembly. Now, some some Bolshevik leaders responded to this problem by suggesting that uh, that uh, uh, an uprising be delayed while while it could be prepared. This was the uh, this was the tack of the Bolshevik military organization, uh, which had been bruised uh, because uh, of its uh, premature action in July. But another approach ran along the following general lines, that Soviets, because of their stature at a popular level, not party organs, should be employed for Kerensky's overthrow. Therefore, that any attack on the government should be masked as a defensive operation on behalf of the Soviet. That every opp uh, opportunity should be utilized to undermine the provisional government's power uh, peacefully and that the overthrow of the government be linked with and legitimized by the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Bolshevik leaders, the ones on the ground in closest touch with workers and soldiers, were more co confident that Lenin, than Lenin uh, that a majority of delegates uh, 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 at the Congress would support the, uh, the formation of an all-socialist coalition government, a Soviet government. This outlook was, uh, was shared by many leading Petrograd Bolsheviks. The most prominent adherent of this strategy was Trotsky. In The Bolsheviks Come to Power, my second book, which took a long time uh, after the first, I'm embarrassed to say, I tried to reconstruct the Bolshevik successful pursuit of these tactics rather than Lenin's. In particular, this involved their utilization of a counter-revolutionary threat to help uh, to create an ostensibly non-party uh, organ, the Military Revolutionary Committee of the Petrograd Soviet, which under the guise of protecting the rev revolution, gained control of virtually the whole Petrograd garrison. Uh, in the process, the government was literally disarmed. After Kerensky responded to the Military Revolutionary Committee's usurpation of command authority over the garrison by initiating a crackdown on the Bolsheviks, the armed action against the government that Lenin had been demanding for a month finally began. This occurred on the night of October 24, 25, only hours before the scheduled opening of the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. 
by then only demoralized, meager, and constantly dwindling numbers of Cossack cadets and women soldiers still defended Kerensky's cabinet, huddled and isolated in the Winter Palace. There was no uh, storming of the Winter Palace. There was no need for a storming of the Winter Palace. Uh, in his book, Red October, the American historian um, Robert V. Daniels concluded that the belated uprising of October 24, 25 was of critical historical importance because by prompting the Mensheviks and SRs to leave uh, the National Soviet Cong Congress, it eliminated the possibility that the Congress would form a multi-party uh, socialist uh, government uh, in which moderate socialists would have had a significant voice. In this way, it paved the way for the formation of an exclusively Bolshevik Soviet government, something that hadn't been mentioned ever before publicly. Analysis of the arriving Congress delegates' political identity and their position on the government question um, uh, indicates that this was indeed the case. However, a more important point was that only after Kerensky's understandable, understandable but hopelessly, uh, hopeless military attack on the Bolsheviks did the armed attack, direct military attack on the provisional government become feasible. The Petrograd workers and soldiers who supported the Bolsheviks in the subversion and overthrow of the provisional government did so because they were persuaded that the revolution and the Congress were in immediate danger. Only creation of a multi-party, exclusively socialist government by the Soviet Congress pending uh, convocation of the uh, Constituent Assembly, which is what the Bolsheviks stood for, seemed to offer the hope of avoiding death at the front and achieving a freer, better life. Let me end by very quickly suggesting what seemed to be the implications of all this in answering the question of how the Bolsheviks won. It is clear that this question is far more complex than traditional Soviet and Western interpretations suggest. To be sure, it was and it remains difficult for me as it has been for virtually every historian of the Russian Revolution to imagine uh, the Bolshevik success in the absence of Lenin's leadership. Uh, most importantly, his call to revolution in the April theses and his appeal for the immediate seizure of power beginning in mid-September. These bold, despite what I've said, these bold interventions by Lenin seem to me to be a vivid example of the sometimes decisive role of the individual in history. Nonetheless, as crucial as leadership, uh, as leadership to the rise of the Bolsheviks and their, to their ultimate success was the correspondence between the Bolsheviks' public program and popular aspirations at a time when the provisional government was blamed for rapidly uh, deteriorating economic conditions, pursuit of the war effort, and tolerance, if not support, of the counter-revolution, and also when all of the other major Russian political parties, uh, the, the cadets, the Mensheviks and the SRs, were widely discredited by their apparent support of Kerensky and his domestic and foreign policies. The most fundamental difference between me and many, though not all, historians of the October Revolution is that, in my view, the ability of the party to accommodate divergent theoretical views and a significant degree of initiative and tactical independence on the part of nominally subordinate agencies, as well as the party's uh, decentralized structure and res responsiveness to the prevailing mood had as much if not more to do with the party's success as did revolutionary discipline, organizational unity, and obedience to Lenin. For it's apparent that the successful tactics of, of the Petrograd Bolsheviks in the fall of 1917 
uh, emerged out of continuing exchange of ideas regarding the development of the revolution and constant interplay between the party, party members at all levels and factory workers, soldiers, and sailors. As I've suggested, and as you well know, in mid-July, uh, mid-September and October uh, 1917, Lenin issued directives which if followed to the letter would have been disastrous. Each time, party agencies and Bolshevik leaders on the spot attuned to rapidly fluctuating political realities and responsive to shifting popular opinion uh, either rejected Lenin's orders or adapted them to fit uh, the prevailing circumstances. From this perspective, Red October in Petrograd was largely an expression of popular uh, uh, forces. As much a complex uh, uh, political struggle uh, as a military contest, in which the fate of the provisional government, though not the composition and character of the new Soviet government was sealed before the military, oper before the military operations uh, emphasized in most accounts. Finally, has my understanding of the Bolshevik success in Petrograd changed significantly over all these years? Has it changed today? Uh, having recently looked through much new evidence, uh, and there, there is much new evidence that really hasn't been studied in, in Russian archives, and I've skimmed uh, quite a bit of it. My answer remains no, not fundamentally. If I could, I would change the title of my first book, Prelude to Revolution. With the perspective of a full century, the July uprising, the February and October revolution, and even the uh, terrible Russian Civil War appear as key phases of one broad fundamental political and social process that might properly be called the Great Russian Revolution, 1917-1921. But I agree that it's possible, depending on what happens in the future, that we may have to change that umbrella. Um, uh, the fresh archival data sheds useful light on many, many uh, long neglected topics. Um, and they add valuable detail to our uh, knowledge uh, of the revolution and the provinces in the center, but they have not undermined my overall sense of the importance of the Bolshevik party's flexible structure and the popular attraction of democratic Soviet power in explaining how the Bolsheviks won. Thank you very much.